we'll start with you, Yaba, because I think you really were the reason all of this began, certainly for those of us at CNN. Why does this matter? We spend so much time, even before I was working on this documentary, and even in the conversations we had when we started talking about this documentary, hand-wringing about who's black, who's not black, what does it mean to be black, a lot of time. Why does it matter? It matters because America is a racialized society, and so we need to know what side of the fence everybody is on. And so we know that within this society, race absolutely impacts people's access to the institutions of this country, whether it's social, political, economic, um, religious, cultural, what have you. And so it matters. I mean, the extent to which we discuss the race of the president of this country, still. Five I mean, years in. Yes. <laughs> And still questions, and so what's interesting to me and why I keep saying that self-identity is important is that Barack Obama has said that I'm a black man. He's written about it in his books. You ask him, he tells you. Yet and still, there are public debates about what he is as if he hasn't announced himself. And so I think um, it really speaks to the, the extent to which he holds power in this country as the leader of this country. And I also think that it's less palatable to say we have a black president as opposed to we have a mixed president. So then, Danielle, what is at root there, right? I mean, I think what Yaba is pointing out is very true. We've had this conversation now many, many times. It's not like he changes his answer every time and we're trying to figure out where he is falling now. So what is really at, at work here? I think it's got to be, be nice. I think it's got to be hard. Uh, for the president, and I think it's got to be hard for a lot of people in this country who just frankly, I believe, based on everything I've read and everything, frankly, most of what I see on CNN, the country is barely ready for it. They're just not ready for it. I think that people do feel that he's black, and they're just not ready for it. He's black, and this is a racialized country. <laughs> he's black. How many of the students, Perry, <laughs> you say it like, he's black, everyone. <laughs> Just, yeah, if that's the takeaway from tonight, <laughs> president is black. We've announced it now. Let's stop with the questioning. Uh, Perry, how many of your students, of the 50 or so students that you have, um, are similar in trying to figure out their pathway when it comes to identity as we focused on Naya, Nayo and, and, and Becca? I mean, are they the rarity and we got the two who are grappling and have lots of angst? <laughs> or, or do you think that's half the group? Is it three quarters of the group? Is it I wish, everybody? I wish I could say that it was just Becca and Nayo and myself <laughs> dealing with this over the, but that's not the case at all. Uh, with the, the uh, activity you saw where I was like, you know, identify you know, go someplace and, you know, figure out one thing that you think, you know, you are, how you identify. And the majority of the room went to other. And when you look at, if you look at the demographic of that day, you know, with, with our, where our kids were, the, the probably maybe five, eight, at least three quarters of them are like, you know, somebody looked at them, they would say, you're black. But it was something that they were really dealing with, they were struggling with. And um, I didn't realize it was going to be that much until we did it, until we had that activity. You know, there was a lot of people dealing with that issue. What am I? Who am I? Does it matter who I am? A lot of them, they just didn't want to identify. You know, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, they just, I don't want to play this game. What are the implications of, of that, Professor? I, 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 when I watch the rough cut of the documentary, I, usually my kids watch it, and I can always tell if they're riveted, it's going to be a good doc. If they start wandering off to do other things, then hmm, probably needs a little more re-editing. Um, <laughs> and, and they're relatively little, and they, they were torn up by watching Nayo. I mean, it was painful for them to watch her struggle with something that is so basic to you know who we are as individuals. You know what? What is the solution to that? Why do we? Why are so many of the students grappling with something that is kind of the building block of who you are? Yeah, I mean, the, the formation of race is very difficult, and uh, identifying your racial self in a world that already identifies you before you really have an opportunity to put uh, your own label on who you are and who you want to be is a very difficult concept to both live with and to struggle with. I think, you know, it comes out so clearly when you look at, and it's heart-wrenching to see seven-year-old children mm. calling themselves ugly, right, because they're black. And with I mean, no compunction. With like no compunction. Like, no, just 
you know, as that is what it is. And that's what? We're talking the second grade. What are, what are the implications of that? So I mean, I so extrapolate 20 years out for me then. So 20 years out, I mean, the, 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 the lived experiences that will come out of that through trying to identify yourself, having the world identify you will create massive confusion in terms of how you see yourself forming as an adult, the choices that you make, uh, the friends that you want to, uh, to be around, the, um, the partners that you want to be with. I mean, this has a, it has life altering uh, effects. Is and the solution more boxes? Nayo's dad is here. I recognize him from the dock. Nice to see you, dad. And, <laughs> and you know, and your, your suggestion seems to be, well, where, where is the box that's, you know, where's Nayo's box? Where is, should none of these boxes apply? Is the answer, well, let's not just have eight boxes. Let's have 20. Let's not have 20. Let's have 30. Let's have 60. Let's have 240. Well, leave it open and you I write mean, it in, right? Is that the answer? I have to admit, I do like it if we have to be counted up in the census. I do appreciate when the list is there and it says check all that you feel applied to you. When I'm home in Oakland where I'm from, it's easy for me to be part black and part Filipino because my Filipino family was there and at my wedding, I remember people saying, who are all these Filipino people? <laughs> Like, that's my cousin Pedro, that's my cousin Jaime, <laughs> that's my cousin Juanillo, that's my cousin. Um, but when, you're, when you identify as black, as, as I do, someone says, what are you? I say I'm African American, I'm black. Um, but someone says, as the whole show is about, what are you though? Sometimes as a black person, you're almost afraid to say that I'm mixed. Why? Or I'm part Filipino. Why? Because you feel like people are going to think you're doing some type of bragging mm -hmm. or that you're doing some type of not <laughs> wanting to fully identify exactly. with being black. Exactly. So my Wikipedia page just went up recently and it says, because they get all in your business, <laughs> that, the, that I'm part Filipino. And black people on my timeline and Twitter are like, what? And I'm like, yes, I am. But the Filipino people that follow me on Twitter who didn't have any idea, they're all like, you need to stand up for your culture, girl. <laughs> is it, a, is it, a, is it a, a victory of some kind? If Nayo says, I identify as a black woman, is that, is that a victory? Is that a, if she says, I identified as a, a, a biracial woman, is that a, what, what's, the, what's the win at the end of this? I think jumping back um, to something Danielle mentioned, which I think is important for us to talk about because this idea of people not identifying as black when we have a history that says here are the parameters and here are the black people. And then here, you know, I grew up in New Orleans, right? So in New Orleans, you have a history of people who self-identify as Creole. Much of their identity is wrapped around this, um, their phenotype, pretty color and good hair, right? And so not black, not white, but Creole. And so growing up, as a black, just regular black person in New Orleans, when the Creoles would come around and start with the, you know, the nose up and all of this stuff, it was our job to let them know that they were black and that they were no better than us, <laughs> right? So you can walk around here saying you Creole and all these things, but when the white man comes in this room, you black just like us, so get it together. But the opposite side of that, right, is the, I mean, just follow me on Twitter you're not really black. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I get that all, I, no, why are you doing a black in America again? Haven't you stopped that? You're mm. not really black. <laughs> and so all the time. And I just, you know, and that's the, f so we're trying to have it both ways, right? right? I mean, and so that's the thing, because somebody would then accuse you of passing, right. right? Or attempting to pass. And so that's what I'm saying, it's a, it's, a, it's a type of schizophrenia of sorts. So you better be black, right? But when you try to be black, you're really not black. And so it's, it's a back and forth thing, but like speaking to what Danielle's saying, I think, and I've heard a lot of this from the contributors in the project, this idea that their parents told them what they are, or their parents set the parameters for them because as children, you go out there talking about I'm one quarter this and I got Indian in my family and all of this, you get beat up. up. <laughs> right? So you keep it simple and you're black and that's what it is. And so I think that idea that parents tell their children what they are because it's hard to navigate the racialized society as adults, 
Does so that change children, in a generation, do you think? I mean, is this a conversation we're going to have now, and if we had this conversation in another generation with the children of all of ours, that it would be a completely different conversation, and another generation after that, it wouldn't even be recognizable. And, you know, people like to talk about post-racial America as if that's something to get to, and I guess I just never felt that way. I never felt that, that somehow there's a win in being post-racial. Yeah, I don't want to be completely pessimistic, right? But... Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> this can't be good. Go but, ahead. But I mean, the real answer is we've been dealing with this issue since slavery, right? Since 1619, when slaves first came to the to the colonies in in this country, we've been talking about this issue of blackness, who's black, what's black. It's morphed. It's changed into different things. It has become not so much just are you black? It's are you real black? Are you fake black? Are you kind of black? Are you black down? <laughs> Not really sure what that means, but right, you know. It, so uh, it, I want to say, yeah, right. It, we are at least having the dialogue about it, and things are getting better, and we are allowing ourselves to sort of s to identify in the ways that we need to. But we're still having this conversation, and once again, I think going back to something that Yava said um, a few minutes ago, which is, I mean, why are we still talking about the president being black? Like, why is that even Danielle still cleared that up for us earlier. <laughs> 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 yes, he is black. We can now move on, America. And he has an American birth certificate. I'm just going to throw that in, too. Um, so it's getting better. It's getting, it's getting better, but it still is. It's an age-old question. It was a very strange thing to interview Danielle and who would sort of say that she knew, and a lot of her struggle in her community was she feels black, and she's felt black, and she you know, was surrounded by white people but felt there was a certain innate thing in her that was black. And then go to an interview with Nayo, who has the same racial makeup, but feels exactly the opposite. She feels like she hasn't had an authentic black experience. What do you think is, well, what's an authentic black experience? I mean, I, I used to get a lot you of know, that it, too. It's so interesting when, when the young sister, when the first authentic black experience um, that she brought out was something that was painful. And, you know, racial profiling. And oh, so, uh, Sophia, who's here? Sophia. Is she here tonight? Oh, she didn't get to come. Um, uh, she has dope hair, by the way. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but wasn't it fresh? But, but um, what's interesting, when you asked me was about black experience, I went straight to music, soul, food, love. Like, it wasn't ju We've been so cultured to identify through pain, to compare each other's pain, that we stay, it's a very comfortable space. And I wanted to, uh, Danielle, you said something, too, about, like, I, I've had the opposite experience, meaning, like, I love my hair. It's very, very happy. But, um, but I do not wear it straight much at all because I feel like at least you will think before you say something about who I am if you see my hair with some texture. When I'm straight, I am a tall, light-skinned, blonde black girl. So if it's straight, that erase, like you, we enter our ethnicity through our hair often. Mm -hmm. And so I, over, I have over-identified. Like, Often I'd be sitting up here with a free Mumia T-shirt. It just got <laughs> because that's true. No, because, because we know, and it's not because I felt like I would. I was bragging if I say that you know my father's a card-carrying member of the North Band of Cherokees. It's because we know that Black people have been so cut out and so left out, and in the senses that those boxes equate money in the community. Okay, so then so there I'm going to say I'm black to give more access to people who don't have it, or when I get in the room, because you're not afraid of me, because I'm light-skinned and I'm blonde, and I've got on some shoes that you can identify, that when I come in, I'm hoping that I'm bringing all my blackness with me. So I, I have thought of my light skin as a way in because you're more, you're more apt to open the door for me than you are for Yaba. So when I come in, I feel like I'm bringing Yaba with me. I, so then, I have felt a burden to be extra black. So then why do we see, and I think a lot of Yaba's work, and you talked about sort of the, the rationale behind your work, is not this, listen, I'm the lever to open the door for more. It feels like a competition sometimes. Well, I think it's back to that being cultured to compare pain. So she's like, so those light-skinned girls were, you know, stank with me, and I'm like, well, those black 
uh, girls think I'm stank before I walk in the door. So not ever knowing that I'm hurting too. And everything that is separating us as sisters is hurting us. So, but we don't have that conversation. We don't have, you, can, you didn't say to me at 12, you know what, I'm really jealous. I'm really jealous that those boys think that you're cute and that your hair is swinging. Right, no, you I know, just, and I, I just never said hair. to you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, no, but you, do you not, th we had that, we had that discussion. My first day of school in an all black neighborhood, I got chased home with girls to cut my hair. That's a real thing that you just said. That's not a, that's not a punchline. No, no doubt. But, and, and you're gonna hate me over something I have no control over. Right. So here we are as black girls battling. I didn't choose my skin color like I didn't choose my height. Her, I have no power over this. Right, but you this, have this, no power over that. But this is but the we've honest been conversation, right? To fight on some so then what's we didn't the, do. is the solution a kumbaya moment is this what what is the solution, really the solution nice. saying listen all you mixed people check the black box cuz it gets connected to money and and power and opportunity for people right. what is the end goal and solution I, I mean think. i think the end is the beginning and that's the conversation like Michaela and i need to go face to face and how you feel yep and then that, and, and when women talk about colorism it's war i don't care where it is it's jigaboos yeah. and wannabes yeah. It's school days, right? It so we're is. on two sides of the fence, and even and, and I think that's the power of the project. And I tell people this all the time. I did this project for me. Yeah, I did it for me, and I'm glad that y'all are enjoying it. But I did it for me, uh -huh. right? Because you know, Toni Morrison has this quote, comes out of Song of Solomon. I'm not gonna curse, but she says. I'm sorry. I already, <laughs> I already did that. You know, Barack Michaela Black, has beat you to it, so you might as well. <laughs> And she's referencing a peacock, and she says, if you want to fly, you've got to get rid of the shit that weighs you down. And this shit weighs me down, right? And so as a dark-skinned woman, like when I saw Lashante, uh, like that was me. I never came out of my mouth and said, I wish I was dark-skinned or I want light-skinned, but everything in my experience said, yeah, but dark-skinned's not cute right now, boo. Right? And so it was pain in there. And so I want to like hug LaShante and like bring her with me for a day for her to see us fly to be dark skinned. Right? Um, I'm just saying. <laughs> that, that was my daughter laughing. That's your daughter. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's real, there's, there's real pain in that. But because of pride, I'm not going to say to Michaela, you know, I used to be jealous of you. Instead, I'm just going to stare you up and down and give you heat when you walk into a room. And so this is about having honest conversation. It's a process that Danielle and I had to go through, right? Because I was stink to Danielle. But wait, you're not talking about me, though. No, 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 boo. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> you know what? She's like, yeah, she's about to take off her earrings. <laughs> Danielle, the documentary. <laughs> no, no. No, no, we're good. We're good. Danielle in the documentary, Danielle. Right, but again, I'm coming to Temple from New Orleans, having this experience with people who self-identify as Creole, being rejected by one of my dear friends. I can't even come to your wedding because your mom has issues. Like, when I come here and I see people who then look like that, I'm clear. There's no need to get close to you. I know what you're about. Hmm. Interesting. I think the hardest job in America is to be a black man. I, I, I do. Yeah, well, I don't like to compare. Wow. Really? Gender? Mr. Okay. Tibbs. <laughs> I, I struggle to use and adopt the language harder, right? I think that there are experiences that we both have that are different, but I don't necessarily know that one is harder than the other. And it may just depend on in what context you may be thinking about what it is to be black male versus black female. I can honestly say this, that I can speak to what it is to be black male. I don't think I could ever speak to what it is to be a black female, right? And so I wanna be honest about that and listen to, to my black women so that I can get an understanding of the type of struggles that they have in this world. And this is a very good conversation for that. So I probably would answer it that way. In I'm my day side job, <laughs> if I had people who are dodging questions like the people on my panel are dodging <laughs> questions, we would take a different approach. Did you want to jump in, Vision? Um, I, I, I'm kind of where you are with the whole asterisk thing, but on, but on top of that, I feel like um, just working with 
young females, young black females, young white females, it's a whole other dynamic that that what do you mean? that in what way? They deal with sexism and racism, and, and a lot of times that that they coincide. So it's something that I wasn't. It's something that my privilege as being a male, because um, a lot of times black men we don't want to admit that we have privilege being a male. We do, you, be you know. Um, me me seeing the privilege in that, just just seeing the things that that um, Safi and Kai and and uh, my 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 compadres all over the city go through. It's like I always thought like yo, it's, it's this, it, it, it gets no rougher than being a black man. It's like wait a minute, hold your struggle is real, queen. Like what you going through, you got to deal with my crap. You know, my, my hidden sexism that's going on, and on top of that, you got to deal with racism. So I don't ever want there to be this, this thing where it's like black men are, go through so much more because we black. It's like, wait a minute, they're going through the same struggle. You know, and, and, and in a lot of ways, it's a lot worse. But so. do, 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 the, um, do the boys talk about it? Do they talk about the hyper violence? Like, you know, no. why I say that it, it's a hard, I mean, I don't feel like it's, I mean, there's, it's so complicated, but I don't feel like as a black woman, I'm, I'm going to get shot. Like, I don't feel like I'm going to be pulled over in the that, same way by, yeah. that, by the police, by and the people so that are supposed to protect me. So we have these very, very different experiences. Certainly there's sexism, but as a black male, I don't feel like I have a target on my chest. And, and I, I feel, feel like I have a target on my chest all day long, every day, all day. Like, I mean, and, that's, and I don't know a black man who, who doesn't feel that way, who is, who is seeped in reality, you know? <laughs> So I don't. So so I, I I'm with like you on 52 that. Fifty-two people were shot in Chicago. Yeah. Like in the last two days. Yeah. All black all males. Black so so I, I, I'm. We we on this. We are we are totally on the same page with that. So I. So I'm kind of with you. Like there's an asterisk. There's, I don't know if there's any worse, any better. But um, we don't deal with the hyper masculinity. And there's something that I'm that I'm myself and poet named um just Greg Corbin and Seth who was in the um in the documentary. We we're really trying to tackle this whole this whole idea of black hyper masculinity because in my eyes there was no more hyper masculine decade than the 90s growing up when when the crack hit. and and we came through that and and and, and as a light skinned man I was trying my best to be the hardest dude on the block knowing damn well that wasn't me you know but it was like you know this hyper masculinity tied into blackness you know you had to be the hyper you had to be the manliest man the most macho man of all time because not only are you man but you're black and so it's like a negative stereotype that's put on you like black men supposed to be you know the man, you're supposed to be tough at all times. You never cry, you never show no weakness. And that's a heavy burden to always have to put on that mask. It's a process, like this is something that I, that I refuse to deal with, you know, even after identifying as black. Because again, a lot of times folks, you know, identify because their parents said, this is what you are. My parents are like, yo, you're both. Until I got jumped by some white kids, you know, and I was in elementary, I'm talking third, fourth grade, I'm getting beat up by eighth, ninth graders, like, yo, nigga, get back across Gerard Avenue type thing. You know, when I lived, when my mom, had, we lived on Poplar Street, right on the other side, the, the quote-unquote white side, yo, get your monkey ass back across Gerard Avenue. So I was kind of beaten into my blackness. I mean, it's real. I can't really say it any other way. Like, it was really this thing where it was like, mom, this is some bull. Like, what you saying ain't right. Like, nah, that's not what they saying out there, mom. Um, so I don't put that on somebody else. So I, I can't tell Nayo, this is what you do. I'm not, everybody has their process. Everybody has to come into their own. And one thing I learned working with teenagers, the more you tell them this is what it is, the more they're going to rebel against it. So, I mean, you can try that when, you're, when, when they're in elementary school and maybe middle school, but teenagers, you say, like, this is what you are. And you're like, nah, B, not at all. You know what I mean? Like, so they're going to they're gonna fight back against that. So for me, it's kind of like, you know, throwing out the questions and letting them answer and bringing it back together. Like, okay, now what does that mean? How do you feel? Who feels differently? And having them bounce questions off each other where it's not this adult telling them what it is or what it should be. They're kind of discovering that themselves and then writing it down and expressing it and not feeling judged by how they feel. Because as adults, we, we shut up because we don't want to be judged. We don't, we don't have these conversations because I, I don't, I don't want to offend y'all, but that's my homie. I might say something that offends y'all, but I might say something that offends y'all. So we don't have these conversations. You know, if you write it down and you say this is a safe space, you can express however you want it. You can have the most the most distant opinion ever, and nobody's gonna judge you. Somebody may have something opposite of that, and you gotta accept that too. So that's kind of where the poetry comes in. Nobody judges in PYP and workshops, and if you do, you're not, you're not that, the judgment thing isn't really welcome at all. Whether it's you know, race, class, um, gender, sexual um, preference, orientation, like that, it, it's not accepted what, what, you know, and what we do, and we, we carry that over into the identity workshop. I don't think that I ever needed anyone to tell me that I was black. I think I needed someone to tell me just how to communicate 
um, with people because I felt like it, I was always getting pushed up on in terms of someone trying to ask me about myself. And I just assumed that, frankly, I was black and I had a whole bunch of Filipino relatives also. And it, it's always been that simple to me. I would like, just because I feel like I don't know if I made myself clear, if I have any regrets about the way I've lived my life, and really I don't, I'm, I'm blessed and I'm happy and all these many things, but I do wish, if only because I loved my great-grandparents and my grandparents and my mother so much, that I would know more just about being Filipino. Mm -hmm. And all I know is like the food. Um, which is great, and I'm happy to have it. But I just want to make clear that my mother wasn't telling me so much who I was, but giving me some type of language as a nine or 10 year old to talk to grown folks and other kids about who I was and that I could do it with some type of pride and simplicity. And she said, you just tell them that you're black and your hair is what, they, what your hair is and to leave you alone. I think for someone like Lashante, what it, she's crying out for are so is something to battle all the images that she's clearly getting, right? There's this whole thing that is coming into this little girl's world right. um, that, that she needs some counter to that. Mm -hmm. You know, she needs to have a thing that she's in love with that that person who she thinks is great, and it's never going to be your parent. You love your parents, but it's got to be the person who's your hero, who you think is amazing, who you think is, and she needs that. And I think her mother needs to make sure that her daughter has these role models who are a range of colors, but include dark brown women who are amazing. Yeah. Who Lashanti can say, that I love Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones plays the piano and she's amazing and she does because that is clearly what she's missing. She's right now getting bombarded by one side and I think right. I have four kids. My oldest daughter is 12 and then I have a 10 year old and I have twin boys who are eight. And that's the age where kids really start looking for, they're looking for something to identify, right? They really are on this path to figure out. My son, one of my twins, um, was diagnosed last year, he's mostly deaf. And the first thing he did was to go online and figure out what presidents were deaf. Could he still be president? And he's like, yeah, they're actually, and there's a handful, like six, we're deaf. <laughs> anyway, right. Oh no. Right, and he's like, okay, cool, I can be president. <laughs> and then he moved on to, well, can you be in the NBA and be deaf? You know, and we kept, and, and I spent a lot of time like running around introducing him to deaf soccer players and deaf baseball players. And I mean, I would literally be like, do you know anybody who's deaf, who plays, who skis, you know? And, and, and so like as a parent, I think that not just for Lashante's mom, but for sort of, she's the, you know, she's gonna be the placeholder for every young kid. You, that's your job as a parent to that's make sure that your kid is, is exposed to this, here's a hero, the, you I know, and you can celebrate them and yeah, yeah, they're deaf. You know, that's so, and look, see, still a hero. That's what that little girl needs, and I hope that her mom is able to provide that for her. You, and if you know, this is, this is a, I think that's a paradigm change, that we have this fly, brilliant, self-defined woman in the White House with two amazing, clearly black from a distance girls. But I think it's too. Def I think it's still too far removed from a distance for a kid. I think yeah, the kid if, needs someone in their if life. If the question is having some kind of I because you know there's some kind of icon, someone that is celebrated, someone that's on television, because these are these images that we are combating. So if all you see are magical white girls on television, you have at least now somewhere else to say this is a princess. This is the, you know, she looks like the queen of America. That is another image that's on the glossy television, that's on the glossy, you know, right. um, um, pages. But I think what's really important, I have a daughter who's 21 who is, you know, she has, she had that color that I always wanted, which was just, she calls herself tawny, you know, that's a 70s term of makeup. But it, the, the, the very fashion fair, but the thing, the thing was important. <laughs> was to tell her she is enough. That's what I, my hope for girls feel that they are enough. And that the, the, the conversation becomes, why is dark not enough? You are enough, that little girl is enough. Right. And here is someone that is elevated to the highest place that a woman can be right now in the country and here's her two little girls, and they look happy. Those are happy black girls. We don't have a lot of happy black girls, you know, jumping up and down at the Jonas Brothers concert on television. And so I think that th there, this is an opening in a time 
to have these kind of conversations and we have at least someone to throw to. But I think um, what you're all... Wait, did you say, I hate them? I do. You hate the conversations? I, I have to. Because you should stop volunteering for panels then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like... <laughs> but wait, wait, wait. I that think would be the first step. <laughs> <laughs> President's <Wait>. still black. <laughs> Danielle well, should not do panels. <laughs> Acknowledging that these conversations are difficult because yes, of course. Because you, don't, you don't feel I'm optimistic in this conversation? Optimistic? Optimistic? <laughs> no, I still feel it's just lame that I'm, I'm the age I am and I still have confusion, still have guilt, still have questions, still have to meet new people and it still has to be the topic of conversation. Like in, in a dream world, in the happy jumping up and down Jonas Brother world, I wish that it was already <laughs> changed. Yeah. Like it just. It breaks my heart on some level, and I guess the girls in the in the excellent documentary um, symbolize that. They epitomize that. That you would want to think that the conversations that my mother had with me when she was going to paper bag parties of her own, which is something that stood out to me a lot. If that young lady is in the audience, that was tough love, honey. Yeah. That was. I might have to have a parent-teacher conference with her if that was my child, but um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying that my mom told me about going to those parties, right. can, and can I, we're still dealing with this, and it, you know, it just will. bothers and me. And I think we will, and I think the thing, the issue is, and I always say, and people say, well, what's the solution? Like, I'm not really trying to find it, because what we have to understand is that colorism is connected to racism, and when if, if you get tired of talking about race, like, I don't hear people saying, about racism, about realities, statistical realities for black people in this country. Oh, I'm tired of talking about that. No, you don't get tired of talking about that. You know what I mean? In terms people tweet me all the time. They're I, they, I think there are plenty of people who feel like, so racism is done, right? We've just elected, the, we <laughs> no. re-elected the president. What I mean is. I, I get that, I get that, I get that all the no, time. No, what I mean no. is when, when a Trayvon Martin happens, I don't hear black people saying, I'm tired of talking about racism, right? But colorism, because it's painful, we want to run, right? But to coming back to this question that you had, Kia, I think the thing that you're all saying is that it's the parent's job and we have a job, but it's a job that's not defined. And one thing that kind of gets under my skin a little bit, I hear people say very like, matter of fact, the solution is, we got to teach our babies how to love, our, love themselves. What's that look like, yeah. right? And so I think of my own daughter, she wasn't allowed to have white baby dolls. I got flack from all my friends, oh, that's racist, nope. They make black dolls for a reason. She's a black girl, and she's going to get black dolls. But at the same time, like what you speak of with your son, that's, that's literally why I said with Lashante, I want to hug her. She's not hearing it from her mom. She's not hearing it from her mentor. I want to hug her. Like she needs to see and hear from other black women that she's beautiful. I remember one day I, I made my Facebook status update, because those things are important. I made, <laughs> I made my update. Um, Something to the extent of, tell a little black girl she's beautiful today. It got like 200 likes. Not that I count likes, but just to say, <laughs> it resonated with people. This idea that when you see, and, and I remember my favorite auntie, Auntie Janet, and she's an aunt by marriage, and she was a light-skinned sister from New York, and she would see me and make this big production every time. Oh my God, your skin is so beautiful. What do you use? Tell me your secret. And she would touch my skin and want to take pictures, and I just knew when Auntie Janet was coming around, I was, I, I was it, you know? And I tell her, I thank her to this day because even though the rest of the world was telling me something, she let me know that my skin was beautiful, it was flawless, it was soft. Don't listen to those people. I thought the same thing in the documentary. I was like, I know, look at her what skin. Does she do to her skin? I, t I told you that. Yeah. I told you that when I saw the trailer. Those <laughs> photographers work for me. They work for me. Uh, um, the, to to kind of, to kind of jump in, I wanted to say, um, while a lot of people are pessimistic, I'm an eternal optimist when it comes to to, to children. Like. Um, I don't, my kids will tell you that I'm, I'm a ridiculous optimist. Like, you can't tell me that I can't change this. You know, you can't tell me that. You know, I, I will fight you tooth and nail. When, when, in 2006, when People IPM was formed, um, I found this here, Greg Corpus in the crowd, and he, he called me, and it was like midnight, and I'll never forget this conversation. He called me midnight and said, Vision, the fight ain't ours no more. We gotta, you know, we in our like mid 20s at this point. This ain't our fight no more. We gotta, we, we gotta say the babies now. And it's midnight. And I'm like, really, dude? And I'm like, <laughs> 
and I and I sat back and I was like, yo, you're right. And that's why people, because they don't have a voice. And I think the, one of the biggest problems is adults try to figure out children's problems with adult mindset. You can't ask, we can't try to get a, we can't try to get the young sister to, to, to solve her problems with, on our standards. You gotta look at how do kids figure, figure out things. They ask questions. When they say, mommy, what's that? That's an airplane. Why? Because it's flying. Why? Throw it right back at them. I don't think I'm beautiful. Why? Because this. Why? And keep throwing it back until they figure out. Like, that's how they learn, by asking questions. So ask the questions right back to them. Why do you think this? Why do you think that? Who told you to ask the questions right back so that they're saying it and you're, you're deconstructing the question because that's how they talk to us? Yeah, it's not about innateness. It's about cultural um, affinity. It's how people are cult acculturated, I would say. And so, yeah, you hear students say all the time, this person is acting black, acting white. It's really based upon stereotypes. People say you, you speak white because you speak proper. Right, people say you act black because you listen to two chains. Like all of these things, they're predicated <laughs> off of stereotype. 